So we should be live any moment now. And it looks like we are officially live. All right. So let me pull up my control room. Welcome, welcome everyone to our super awesome Taringa Ranch weekly program. It's sort of like the Sunny and Cher show around here. You never know who's gonna show up. You never know what we're gonna talk about and you never know what we're gonna do. But you definitely know that it's gonna have to do with local native wildlife and some of the coolest people that are involved with it. So here we are tonight with, um, we've got, uh, and, and I, the, the only order here is alphabetical order. So um, we've got Denis Calais, We've got um, Paul Falstich, and we've got Janet Pesaturo. And I hope I said everyone's name correctly. So I'm gonna start with just a little bit of a bio about each of these people who are amazing. And then they are going to each take a few minutes to share their screen and um, share some of their stories. And then at the end, we are going to answer questions. So if you have questions, please put them into the chat at any time. And we will be happy to take them a little bit later on in the program. All right, so let me start with these little biographies. First, I will start with Denis. I was born in France and always been drawn to nature. As a child, I explored caves and rock quarries close by my country home in France in search of fossils and other geological discoveries. I always had a passion for exploration and a reverence for what nature has to offer. I always felt more comfortable in nature, exploring nature and involving myself with the ebb and flow and the impact we have on our natural surroundings and environment. When I emigrated to the United States, I was awestruck by the vastness of the country. So much to see and explore and nature was calling. I became involved in photography and my passion spilled over into conservation and education. Eventually, I turned my passion for photography into my passion for mountain lions and bears and all the amazing creatures that are living amongst humans or in very close proximity. I'm a very dedicated person and I want people to be aware of the animals around them, not to fear them, but to respect and appreciate them and always give people my time to help bring awareness to the animals. I really enjoy being in nature and sharing my passion for it with everyone I come in contact with. I want to inspire others and help others to be aware of the fragility of nature and our responsibility as human beings to be better stewards to one another and the animals and to nature. It's not about attention seeking or self promotion and it's always willingness to help others with questions or trail cam repairs. I built several trail cams to observe nature and observe animals in their environment without infringing on the animal's own well being. I try to minimize my impact on the animal's environment by observing their habits via trail cams. And that was Denis Calais. And it's so impassioned. He's so French. I love uh, that, Denis. <laughs> can't help it. <laughs> and then Paul Falstich is professor of environmental analysis at Pitzer College. He holds a doctorate in anthropology with a specialization in cultural ecology. He has been a Thomas J. Watson fellow a research associate at the East West Center, a senior Fulbright scholar, a visiting scholar at Flinders University in Australia, a, culture, a cultural specialist with the US Information Agency, and a fellow at the Center for Resource and Environmental Studies at the Australian National University. Dr. Falstich's research includes ecological restoration, wildlife documentation, and environmental art, which he has exhibited locally and internationally and which I have personally gone to see, and it was super cool. And next, Janet Pesaturo, a Massachusetts native, Janet admired the flora and fauna of her suburban surrounds from an early age. A seventh grade teacher inspired her interest in life sciences, <gasps> my heart, which she has pursued in a variety of ways over the past several decades. She has a medical degree and practiced psychiatry for about 10 years, before leaving to raise her children full time, where she continued to practice psychiatry. Just kidding. Um, 
Um, in 2004, she launched Animal Trackers of New England, formerly Nashaway Trackers, a group of wildlife enthusiasts who tracked for fun and occasionally provided data to local conservation organizations. Soon thereafter, she began using trail cameras to learn about wildlife behavior. In 2013, she completed a master's degree in conservation biology, and in 2014, she earned a level three cyber tracker certificate. Get it? Janet has led many tracking walks and has given several presentations on tracking and camera trapping. In 2018, her first book, Camera Trapping Guide, Tracks, Sign, and Behavior of Eastern Wildlife was published. She currently authors the blog, Winterberry Wildlife. Ah, you guys, oh my goodness. I feel so honored to be in your presence today. So let's start with uh, Denny. And if you would, I'm going to um, make you the host so that you can share your screen and you can tell us some, you know, share with us your favorite pictures and maybe some of the stories behind them. So let's see, let me share some pictures. And while he's getting that figured out, you know, I don't want to take away with my amazing camera trapping, but that's what's happening behind me. I know, I know, it's really cool, but. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna start talking. Okay, all right. <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk about your own work anyway. It's always a difficult things to do. But um, I started to build a DSLR trap to, to get really uh, inspiring picture of wildlife and snapshot of uh, their lives in, in the wood. And um, I developed some DSLR with flash. It's basically like a studio in the outdoor and to get a very, to get intimated with the, the wildlife. So all my picture basically are ground level picture. Nothing is in looking from above, it's always at the eye level of the, of the, the animal. So like this mountain lion, it very, very, it was very interesting because I have him on video looking at the camera, I try to figure out what it is. And he's very, very timid, very inquisitive and smelling it. And you can get those kind of position where you look, just imagine yourself to be the animal and looking at the camera and try to figure out what it is. You will get the same curiosity on, 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 the, on the camera. So this is what I like to do. I like to take picture that way. This is kind of like what I, I prefer to do. Uh, I don't like picture from above. I don't like picture from the side. I want to see the eye. I want to see the facial expression of the animal. Because they do, they do smile. They do, they do uh, express themselves on the on the face. So that's one probably one of my best pictures of a mountain lion. And you can see on the leg, he has a little bit of blood. So I suspect he ate something on one of the legs. And uh, so let's see the other picture. No. Everybody like a bear with a bear cub. So this is nature. Time to time, you can have those pictures with a bear and a bear cub, which is kind of great. So same thing, DSLR, flash picture. Oh, this was an amazing picture, I think. It's a mating ritual of a gray fox and I have a series of 50 pictures like that. Oh, they're playing together, they're biting the neck, they, um, they're running around, they, uh, they're jumping around, they're jumping on each other. And this one, both, they have their mouth open and I thought it was a great picture. Uh, everybody loves raccoon, right? They're great. The banded. They came in and the same thing, they were so interested about the camera. They were so interesting and they just looked at it as like a duo, you know, like gangsters, you know, they come in and they just want to look at it. And uh, I thought it was a great picture. It just, um, and the, the thing also about camera trapping is a lot of people will say, how come it's not centers? 
Well, we don't choose. We don't choose the way the animal is going to come and trigger the, the sensor. We don't choose. We just assume they're going to do that. But we do not choose. <laughs> Nothing like a bobcat with his butt in the air. <laughs> it just, uh, and the sky behind it, and looking, take a look at the camera. It's, I thought it was a great picture. Another cat. So this one is a different cat from the other one. This one came like two weeks later at the same spot. But I thought it was kind of like so intense, the look. Everybody love coyotes, right? So coyotes always, is actually the mountain lion is my favorite, but coyote will come second. They're very, very wary. They're very intelligent. They, uh, they, they know when something changed in the environment. I don't know if you guys try to change your camera position. And when the coyote come in, they will say, well, this is not normal. It's been like that for five years. And suddenly everything changed. Hmm. And they will notice the change in the wild. They will notice the change. And they get very wary. They will avoid it. But I did have coyote playing with the, I did have a coyote in a, in a vertigo mountain playing with the flash, understood he was triggering the flash and he jumping around left to right to trigger the flash. We killed the flash later on, but he was playing with it. It just kind of like the flash. I don't know why, but I wouldn't like to be flashed for 60 times. This is an intense picture. I'm, I'm not gonna take your rabbit, I promise, but it just, same thing, same spot, blue sky, the grass. I thought it was a pretty dramatic picture. And back to the beginning. That's it. Oh my gosh, I love it. I mean, oh. I can share a lot. I got a whole website. I have, I have a gigabyte of video and, and picture. Everybody does. It's just, you got to pick something you think for you, it's close to your heart. This was awesome. And I already have some questions, but I'm gonna save them until after. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, let Paul go next. Okay. I'm going to make you the host there. All right. So I can share? Yes. Great. Um, well, we should be sharing now. Um, thanks, Denis, for sharing your skills with us. Absolutely remarkable, just phenomenal. Well, thank you, Paul. And um, you know, Denis is is one of my one of my deep mentors in this process. And I, you know, most of the cameras that I use are small cameras, like the one that this bear, this black bear, is coming face to face with. Um, they're these small, rugged trail cams, but Denis is using these DSLR camera traps that he's pieced together himself, which create, you know, a, an opportunity for much higher quality um, images in terms of resolution and lighting and stuff like that. So my hat's really off to him. I only have one of those sorts of cameras that Denis employs all over the place, and mine actually... Um, uh oh, I'm not okay. There we go. Um, uh, mine is one that Denis built for me, so it's his creation. It's you know, what you see strapped to the tree here is a digital single lens reflex camera. Um, and uh, to, to the side, there is one of the two flash units that um, get, gets triggered. So uh, again, I would not be able to capture images at the quality that Denis does without his expertise and, uh, and actually crafting this bundle for me, which I really very much appreciate. Mm -hmm. They're delicate <laughs> systems and lots of times I'm pulling my hair out and Denis knows that I've gone back to him and said, hey, fixes for me, something's not right. Um, there's always something to keep you on your toes. You have to be really patient um, with camera trapping, especially when you're using um, the quality of 
equipment that that the knee does. Um, the plastic Ziploc bags here are simply for you know for waterproofing, and um, the Pelican cases are to bear proof um, the uh, the equipment as well. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with camera trapping, I just wanted to show you this slide of this bobcat looking up in the corner here that gives lots of information. Um, it, 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 first of all, you have the date there, so you can see, so every picture is imprinted with the, the, the time and date. So this was taken February 6, 2019 at 8.02 in the morning. It was 31 degrees, there was a waxing crescent moon, and the M5 means that this was a motion triggered image, and this was a fifth out of, fifth out of 10 frames um, that, that I pulled out here to show. Um, some of the cameras also can um, capture video, which, um, which I've done here, and as Denis says, who doesn't love a mama and her youngins? So the spotted deer always bring a smile to me. One of the things I love about camera trapping is that you don't know what you're going to find when you go back there. And it's always a gift when you have something beautiful and exquisite where the animals are engaged in more or less their natural behavior. Um, and, and pretty uninterrupted. Yes, you, 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 there's an impact. You've placed equipment there. Sometimes there's a flash, but usually um, the animals are pretty unencumbered by that and are engaged in their natural activities. And it's really a privilege to be able to, to catch a glimpse of that in my estimation. Wow. Black bear. This bear lulled in front of my camera for several hours, <laughs> resting and stretching and looking at his nails and all sorts of um, fun stuff. And it just cracks me up. You know, the behaviors that we sometimes see these animals engaging in. So much of us is reflected in them um, that I, I find it both really kind of fun and also profound. One of the things that camera traps have done is giving us, it, it, they have given us a glimpse into some of the behaviors of wildlife that we really didn't know a whole lot about. And it's through, largely through camera traps that we've come to learn, for example, that mountain lions aren't as socially isolated as we once assumed that they were. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of interaction and social engagement among the lions also called cougars, pumas, panthers, a mom and a cub. Um, these two lions, in, in a moment, you'll see them um, engaging in the flame and response right there. And if you listen carefully, you can even hear some deep kind of guttural purring um, that flame in response is a, a response that allows them to better process pheromones and, and get olfactory information from their surrounding environment. This, um, this video clip was made, that, this capture happened, I'll just wait a sec, <laughs> let it sniff its way out. Um, this capture happened four minutes before I arrived on the scene here. Um, with my daughter. So undoubtedly these cougars heard us approaching and heard us coming and they moved down canyon and stayed there because um, I, I caught little, little sounds from them uh, now and then and stayed there and probably kept an eye on us while I was checking this camera trap. Um, but when I of course tried to um, stalk them a bit and follow them down, they were totally gone um, without a sight or a sound. I never saw them, but, uh, but they were right there. So we'll just watch this guy for a few more seconds and then I'll advance this. Because this kind of behavior is really a privilege to be able to witness, I believe.
So they're curious too. They're checking us out. I'm sure that that for those of us who do a lot of camera trapping, these individual animals know who we are and they recognize our scent. Um, and being able to capture the majesty, the um, as Denis indicated, there's a lot of spontaneity and serendipity in these. You never know what you're going to capture. I mean, yes, you position the camera in certain ways to get certain angles, but that being said, you can come back and find nothing or have hundreds of captures of wind, um, or you can have something pretty incredible, you know, a really neat, unique view of a critter. And um, this should be playing, there we go. Um, and then just be, being able to see kind of day-to-day activities of a fox family, kind of roughhousing and engaging um, in activity that we otherwise don't get to um, witness or participate in. And you see how agile these creatures are. And, um, and again, you can see here that they're really not paying any mind to the cameras. They're, they're going about their, their playing and um, We'll just take a moment here and watch and then I'll advance it. And again, that serendipity, you never know what you're gonna get. Here are two, awesome. uh, two owlets. Um, one, well, we'll say they're both photobombing. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's a really grainy image. It's, it's low quality, but it brings a smile to my face every time I, I watch it or I, I get to see it. Um, same with, with this image of these two birds. You know, I, that's not what I placed this camera here for. It's, the camera's pointed toward a creek. I expected and I did get images of animals drinking from the creek and stuff. But then you get these, you know, these sorts of captures that are just out of the blue, total serendipity that are really a gift from the camera, a gift from the animals. And then I just want to close by acknowledging that this is Mount Baldy, which I, I live at the base of Mount Baldy and I do my camera trapping at the base of Mount Baldy in the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, and this is the ancestral homeland of the Tongva people. They call Mount Baldy Uat, which is Snowy Mountain or the place of snow. And I just want to uh, acknowledge Tongva and thank them for having cared for this land for eons before it came to be known as California and Claremont where I live. Were it not for their stewardship of the land, we wouldn't be able to do this camera trapping that we so much love. Um, so that's it for me and I will stop sharing. All right, awesome. All right, and last but certainly not least, we have Miss Janet. All right, so, all right. Oh, so I share screen now, right? And then I pick, okay, I think I will start with my website. I didn't prepare a slideshow. Those are really hard acts to follow, by the way, so. <laughs> Not for you. <laughs> no. Anyway, um, so for me, camera trapping or trail camera use grew out of tracking. Um, I started tracking many years ago, but I found it frustrating that I, we could, I could only imagine what the animals were doing. And um, starting to use trail cameras allowed me to envision what I could only imagine through tracking. So, um, so that's, that's how I got into, got into it. So um, I teach tracking or at least used to because of the pandemic, I haven't been doing any outdoor programs, but, um, and I blog about it. I use mostly uh, regular off the shelf trail cameras, but we do have two DSLR camera traps that my husband built 
and he just uh, wrote his first blog post on that, just sort of an introduction to it, which people can uh, go to our site. And this is an example. Uh, this raccoon is one of our better uh, DSLR camera trap photos. Um, it's a heron here. Um, let's see. And then I'll show you my YouTube channel where I'm mostly interested in the video, seeing what animals are actually doing. And I'll show you a really cool one here if I can find it. Um, here's one here. Okay. So these otters, if you turn up your sound, you might be able to hear their vocalization. We're not seeing them though, Janet. Oh, you're not seeing them? Oh, yeah. No one's seeing them? Mm -mm. You can't see this? No. no? Oh, I... So let's stop share. Yeah. Now share screen again. Yeah. Can you see this? Mm -mm. You can't see a video here. You're not sharing yet. I just, okay. There you go. Yes. Okay. Yes. You see this? Okay. Yes. Yes. Woo. Okay. So um, these are otters at, at their latrine site. So one of the things you, when, if you get, if you, if you get good at tracking, you can really uh, figure out the good places to put the camera so that you can get interesting activity. So I put the camera here for two reasons. One is it's facing a beaver dam and lots of animals are attracted to beaver dams for various reasons. Some of them use it as a crossing structure, like as a bridge to cross the water. Otters often haul out near beaver dams and they often create their latrines there. And um, you get a lot of behavior at latrines. Um, as you can see, they, it's not only a place where they drop their spat and urinate, they also uh, play and wrestle and groom and vocalize and what they're talking about there we can only imagine but I just love seeing what they're doing you know in their natural habitat I'll we'll just let this run through and that's awesome that's something we don't have here in southern California yeah definitely yeah. not Okay, let me see if I can pull up another one. It's another interesting one, if I can find it. You guys can see this still? Yep. Yes. Okay. So we have a beaver here at his scent mound. And um, early in my tracking uh, education, I learned to identify beaver scent mounds but I never knew what it looked like, how beavers make these. And so I uh, started putting cameras at these scent mounds and you can see them carrying up the debris that they dredge up from the bottom of the pond. And um, I think you can hear that squirty sound <laughs> that he makes when he deposits his urine in castorium. Castorium is um, some stuff they use for scent marking. So these are territorial, um, they're uh, when they build these mounds and they mark them with their scent, they're telling other beavers that this land is already occupied and no other beavers uh, can enter without an altercation. So that's what that's all about. Let's see what other interesting And just a really easy way to get a lot of wildlife activity um, is to, let's see, I'll put on this one. This is targeting a beaver dam. You guys can see this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just because beaver dams make great wildlife crossing structures, as I said before, and this one was just really busy with, uh, with lots of different activities. So you get the beaver working on his, his dam but you also get a lot of other animals just walking across it. There's a lot of stuff going on. Bobcats love to use them. They often set mark on beaver dams. 
What I tell beginners um, is that if you really want a big bang for the buck to get- Is that right, Fox? Uh, Fox? Or is that the coyote? Those coyotes, yeah. Coyote. Some turkeys. Um, to get immediate, some hominids, immediate gratification with your trail camera, the, um, the best way to do that is to put it near a beaver dam if you live where beavers range because so many animals are attracted to it for, for different reasons. There's a moose. There's our coyote. The beaver working diligently. That a little bit further here. And I think this is the mother bear with her little cubs in the springtime. Oh, they're teeny. Oh, they're teeny. Yes, I followed those cubs all summer long. And Too precious. Bear Cub are the master of rearranging the cameras. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> they, they work for the director. <laughs> uh, so uh, sometimes I just choose strange things to, I just, you know, to, to target. Here's an interesting one. This is just in my backyard at a blueberry bush. I want it. These are turkey, wild turkey poults and mother turkey. <laughs> They came to eat them just to see what comes, you know, uh, just playing around. I used a, this Bushnell camera I used uh, comes with some close focus lens so um, I could get close up pictures. Apparently rabbits eat blueberries too. And then there were some interesting interactions here. The chipmunks uh, really wanted to get the berries, but the robins were always trying to drive them away. <laughs> you see that little chase in the back there, but the chipmunk never gave up. So just something you can do right in your own backyard. You don't need to, you know, necessarily find any anything exotic to uh, to see interesting behaviors. Is that bird again? And then the turkey poults come back. They're my favorites. Let's see if I can find any, some other less than, uh, some sort of unique, strange spot. Uh, Do you get any wild pig over there? We don't have wild pigs here. No, no wild pig. No. Oh, here's a cool one. This was from quite a while ago. This was a completely incidental capture. Listen carefully. Put your volume up. You hear that? You hear that? Wow. That's great. So this is a grasshopper mouse. I'll stop it and explain. That's a grasshopper mouse. Um, I forgot what I was targeting here. I think I was just targeting a kangaroo rat burrow maybe. And this grasshopper mouse appeared and um, he was howling. <laughs> so um, the pitch, when it's at normal speed, the pitch is too high for some people to hear. I can hear it, but I know a lot of people can't hear it. I'll let it go again, listen carefully. And then I, then I slowed it down 25%. And it's low enough pitch for. Hmm. So just an odd thing that it came up that I didn't target. It was just an incidental capture. I like to get, you know, I just like to get animals at all doing all different kinds of behavior. So I'd like to find my kangaroo rat dust bath if I can. 
Um, if you're familiar with, well, you guys in the West, I'm sure you're familiar with kangaroo rats. They create these little dust baths in the, in the sand. And sometimes they go back to the same uh, places to dust bathe. And where is it? I don't know if I can find that one at the moment. Well, that's a great reason for us to subscribe to your YouTube channel so we can find it and check it out. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, I guess I can't find that one. Oh, if I have time, I'll do one more here. Do I have time or no? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. This is one I worked on getting for a long time. This is a roughed grouse at his drumming log. Mm. And again, with a close focus lens here and on a bush now, and he's doing his courtship and territorial display. So I had to locate the log. They, they uh, roughed grouse um, have certain logs that they, um, they sort of claim the log and they go there every day during, particularly during the breeding season, but they can do it at any time of year. And they generally stand in the same spot and display over and over and over again. Um, so, you know, you just need to learn like the specific microhabitat characteristics to look for and need to know how to identify their droppings. The way you find it is you find the, uh, an accumulation of grouse droppings on the log where he stands. Um, uh, I got some DSLR photos here too, but I don't have those uh, handy to show you. But you know, it took me a while to get the video and the photos that I wanted out of this. But. So this one was very deliberate. Unlike the grasshopper mouse, which was just an incidental uh, interesting capture, this was something I worked really hard at, at getting. You know, I knew he did what he did, but I wanted to see him do it. <laughs> Can you say this is a standard um, trail cam? That, yes it is, but that it's a Bushnell nature view that comes with some close focus lenses. Okay. They screw on to the regular lens. It, the camera has some interesting strengths and weaknesses. It gets great daytime uh, images, but it's, um, it's nighttime images are not so good. They're just very grainy black and white. And um, it has a slow recovery speed, so it's not, you know, it has its limitations, put it that way. It's not my favorite camera, but for close up daytime stuff, like with, with birds, it's really good. So there you have it. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate this a lot. All right, let me, do you have any more you're gonna share? If you want me to, I can, you know. If I can share after Janet, I would like to share something. Okay. For you guys, well, for you guys well, to see. Okay, cool. Well, stop share. All right, let me uh, give it to Denny here. Bring the sound high. <laughs> Do you see it? Yes. I can't. Oh, uh, yeah. I can't see that. It just looks black to me. Yeah, we don't see a video. We see a bunch of little videos and then a black, a dark screen. Maybe oh, you no. want to click on the video and then share just the video, the one video. Let me get out of it for see if I can. I know what I did. I did do. Let me get it. Do you see it now? Yes. <gasps> yes. <laughs> this is a mating call. That's so cool. She's loud. <laughs> and she's right by the camera. So I use the reconics and the sound is very good in reconics and record it. 
it just but this this video is going to show between cougar call and bobcat call is not as intense than the the mountain lion I have a really intense bobcat one I could yeah there was that the was the bobcat one a um was was that a mating was that a caterwaul no what? this one was a, she was calling a kitten I think she oh, lost I one kitten that night one got separated because that's so her. I got 25 video going back and forth with one kitten before that there was two and she's going back and forth back and forth and she I think she lost one oh that day gosh. yeah she lost one that day hmm. But the, the lion call is really intense. I mean, if if you walk in the dark and you hear that, you just might just reconsider walking in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, we actually have some questions here. So I will go ahead and ask those. Um, Carol is asking for recommendations for favorite trail cameras. And if you could throw in um, super basic for like a beginner and then maybe a little bit more advanced for maybe Carol, she probably has more experience than me. Um, and anyone could just jump in with. Well, I can give my favorites. Um, I don't really think of them in terms of beginner to advanced. They're not, I mean, it's just, it's really your budget, you know? Um, the, my two favorites that are sort of mid-range that cost a little less than $200. One is um, the Browning Recon Force. Um, yeah, it's a really nice camera. Um, the, the video quality is really, really good. It has good audio. It's trigger speed and recovery speed is really fast. I mean, it's really fast and it doesn't miss much, put it that way. Um, it's a nice, reliable camera. I really love it actually. Um, and then, and that one has a red glow flash. So I'm, I kind of divide it up in terms of flash. If you, if you want a completely black flash that's virtually in, uh, invisible to animals, I would go with a Browning Spec Ops, which is basically the same camera as the other one I mentioned, the Recon Force, uh, but it has a completely black flash. And the Recon Force has a red glow flash. Uh, so animals can see it a little bit, but you get slightly better resolution on your nighttime photos. Um, and if you want a white flash one, the only reliable one I know of is unfortunately very expensive. It's um, the Reconyx Ultrafire WP9. Yeah, there is also the Reconyx, uh, the XP, XP9 and the XR9, but they're very expensive. Yeah. They, they're not cheap, but they, the trigger speed is not as good than the yeah. Browning, exactly. but the quality, the sound quality when you record is really, really, really good. You can even extract the sound and use it for other things. It's, uh, but the Browning, the recount advantage, uh, this is a very good camera. I got 12 of those. Yes, <laughs> They're great for the money. I'll just, um, I'll second what Janet and Denis have already said. If you ask any, any, uh, camera trapper that I know, um, the Browning Recon Force is going to be kind of a go-to camera. And it's a third the price of a good Reconyx. I love the Reconyx cameras, but you know, you can, you know, 600 bucks is, is typical there. Um, and a good resource I would recommend if you want to compare cameras is the website trailcampro.com. Um, they, they've done camera tests and they have a kind of really easy to read chart about the advantages and dis this, the, the trigger speeds, the, the distance of the flash, recovery time, all of that kind of stuff. So it's a good resource. You know what I like about the, the Browning is the angle of the detection. Mm -hmm. It's so large. Right. You don't see the animal right away, but you can see him, you can see the animal walking like you were filming with a with your own DSLR cameras. It just really make more like film. You really dare to film. Now I really like that. The detection is really really good. Hmm. The detection happened way before the animal entered the frame. 
It's just very, yeah. I think you make good videos. Yeah. yeah. All right, great answers, you guys. All right, another one for everyone. How do you decide on a location for placing your cameras? That's from Rebecca. I use Google Earth. Oh, really? Kendra already gave some indication about her, you know, her employing tracking skills to find where the ruffled grouse has been displaying, um, finding the beaver scent mounds and setting up there. So you, you learn to identify animal trails, you know where they're likely to cross a creek, stuff like that. Um, however, I will say I also set up cameras sometimes at places I don't expect or don't necessarily think I'm going to get something just to find out what, what, what I don't know and what happens there. And lots of times I'm surprised. So I try to think outside the box and, and think beyond what I know when I'm placing my cameras. Yeah, I use Google Earth and I look at the landscape to see the way it's set up. I use a lot of flood area because tendency if, if I put myself in place of a lion, I try to get the easy path. Right. I, yeah. I will place cameras in, in canyon bottoms or on ridge tops, ridge yeah. lines. Yeah. But I like the flat because that's the way I would like to rest too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take a nap. That's why lion take nap on flat surface. Right. Take a nap, it's great. <laughs> Yeah. And probably for large animals, if you focus on large animals, look using Google Earth is going to make a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, but some animals, you know, um, if, if you're doing smaller animals, you might want to be sort of on a finer scale. So mm -hmm. I kind of think of it in two ways. Um, you know, do I want to just get sort of general activity of, you know, do I want lots of activity regardless of what, you know, of, of any species, right? Then I'll look for things like uh, animal trails and crossing structures. Um, uh, and you can do it in the, in the West where it's arid. Um, you can look for a water source that'll attract a great many species. Yeah. Here there's water everywhere. So we look for ways for animals to cross over the water. It's sort of the other way around. Um, if you just point your camera at a pond here, you're not gonna necessarily get a lot because there are ponds everywhere. Mm. Um, and, and then if I want specific, say, you know, if I just want to learn something more about an animal's behavior, um, I will, you know, say I want to learn about badgers, I'll look for a badger dig or a badger den and, and target that and see, see, just see what happens there. Um, given, I mentioned the otter latrine before. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, general landscape features and also finer scale looking for specific uh, animal sign and, and tracks. And listen to Janet. She literally has written the book <laughs> on trail camera trapping. So good advice there. Basically, the whole point of my book is how to find the good spots. It's using knowledge of um, tracking skills and your knowledge of animal behavior to determine good locations. Because when I started um, using trail cameras, I didn't know anything about them really. I didn't know what one was until I, until I got one. I didn't even know they were used by hunters, to be honest. Um, and I really was in a, at a beginning level of my tracking ability. So I assumed that somebody had already written such a book and I went onto Amazon and searched um, for a book on trail cameras that would tell me how to determine good places to put it. And there was no such book. So over the years, I just kind of accumulated, you know, that kind of knowledge. And then I figured, well, why don't I just write the book that I was looking for years ago? And that's how that came about. I love it. That's awesome. All right. Um, oh, we have lots of compliments about Claremont. Claremont rocks. <laughs> I'll second that. And uh, Dan Barron says, thank you, Paul. Always appreciate your work, especially during this time. We live in a beautiful area surrounded by life. It raises optimism. And then Michael Colby says, how frequently do the animals rearrange your cameras or change the aim of them? Well, if I may answer that one, bears are the 
primary redirecting cameras, bear <laughs> cubs. They, they, they're very curious. Bears are very, very, very curious. And they will arrange your camera every single time. <laughs> and if it's too tight, they will try to dislodge. I did have a, a bear in the Angeles National Forest ripped out the camera from the tree, put it in his mouth. So, and the camera was still shooting. And I, for like, I don't know, 30 seconds, I see the mouth of the bear try to chew on the camera and he dropped it and didn't drop it very far, only 20 feet from the point the, where the camera was attached. So I recover it. And that's when I knew the bear, but it totally ripped it off. That's when I use metal box for every single camera. The bears are notorious. notorious. Um, they're notorious pranksters when it comes to your trail cams. And um, not only the bear cubs, but I've found, and I don't know if, if you, Denis and Janet have found this also, that as bears are coming out of either hibernation mm -hmm. or the winter season, they're either grouchy or they're trying to reclaim territory, but they'll be pretty aggressive sometimes uh, with the cameras and kind of tear them down and stuff like that. So, um, so, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's bears um, that they're the ones who. I got coyotes uh, try to dislodge a camera, try to break the webbing, you know, you put around the camera, behind the camera to attach it and they got successful, but they get very wary. So it's just, but bear, bear is the, the best candidate for that. <laughs> Definitely. I think I probably, well, probably have more trouble with people than with bears. Um, most of the bears here, maybe a little bit different here. Occasionally there's one that plays with the camera, but most of them don't really touch it here. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I would say maybe nine times out of 10, they don't bother the camera. Huh. You guys are seeing them all the time that they- Yeah, they do it all the time. I was there today in the mountain and didn't fail. In film, you gotta I've sniff it. Them. I gotta sniff it. Yeah, I've had them actually literally destroy cameras. Um, well, in fact, uh, Denis, the last time you fixed a camera for me, that was because of a bear. Yeah, yeah. knocked it into the water. So. Wow. That's costly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do, I also use security boxes and locks so that really, um, the on, a, on the rare occasion here that bears do try to dislodge it. They really can't move my camera. So I haven't had one. This but I get people too. people. Mm -hmm. Today, I got a bunch of kids spitting on the camera and just pointed the finger at the camera. Yeah. They were like 12 years old, 12 years. I wish the camera could talk, <laughs> scare, scare them a little bit. But that that does raise, you know, it, it, it brings up the issue of um, the ethics of camera trapping and sort of big brother in the forest and how people respond to that. Yeah. And it's worth being mindful of that. Um, I think, especially as more and more people mm. are, are utilizing this technology and, you know, we do venture into the woods, into nature as a place to get away and a place of solitude. Yeah, it's true. Or, you know, and if there are cameras everywhere, um, you know, it, it, it's it's worth being aware of how people, why people respond the way they do to seeing yeah. uh, to seeing these things. Yeah. Thus, I started to put a little sticker on the camera. You know, wildlife research. You know, call if you have any question. You know, yeah. I never got a call, but yeah, I, I do that as well. I have a sticker stickers on my cameras. But in addition, um, I, I have an arrangement with my community where I'm doing research in our wilderness yeah. park. And um, I have an agreement that I will actually put up signs before you in, be, even though I'm off trail entirely and in remote areas of the wilderness park, I do have posted that there are trail cameras in place and that your privacy might be impacted if you venture further on. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. But most of the time, my cameras are so low on the ground, the only thing you will see is feet. Mm. And but people will make a special effort to try to look at, to put their face <laughs> into the camera. 
but that's okay. It is what it is, you know. I try to keep my cameras out of the line of sight of people. I try to keep them away from human trails. So I just focus on trying uh, trying to make it so that people don't see them. I do not use any kind of sticker or sign because it seems like there, no matter what you say, there are people who yeah. that that's going to trigger. So for mm -hmm. example, I, um, I've met some people that um, think of wildlife researchers as the enemy, the people that are trying to place restri restrictions on human activity on land. So they told me that if they ever saw a trail camera that said it was for research, they would either steal it or destroy it. So I don't put that on there. And okay. I know that there are people who, who assume, there are other people who assume that trail cameras are for hunting and they will try to destroy that because they don't believe in hunting. And other people who are hunters and think that you, you know, you with your camera are trying to steal their deer so they will destroy or steal or take out the SD card or turn it off, you know, that kind of thing. So I just try to focus, keep it away from people, keep them locked in a security box so they can't mess with it and just avoid, um, you know, having that kind of interaction. Years ago, I have, um, I put a couple cameras in the forest and I use Python cable. And this, but I put a camera on the tree plus another camera surveying the camera. Mm -hmm. And I got this hunter yeah. with his knife tried to cut the, every thread of metal. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was kind of pathetic. Yeah. The guy spent an hour trying to to cut those metal thread. And I'm like, I can win. <laughs> I can win, you know. I mean, it's just, um, and during hunting season, they can shut it with a gun. Anyway, and nobody will wonder why there is a, a shot fire in a forest. So yeah. it doesn't really matter. It's part of the thing, you, you're you gonna lose some. Yeah, yeah it is what it is. Yeah. Wow, super interesting. Some of that hadn't even occurred to me, but yeah, I'm. that's, do you get, does, would each of you say you get humans pretty regularly on your cameras? Oh, I get people just um, expose themselves pee on cameras. Oh, yeah. Uh, I get people very infrequently because of the re very remote uh, locations that I choose. Mm. I get them infrequently because I just don't put them near human activity. I live in Massachusetts. We have one of the most population dense states. But the fact is, is that most people here don't go too far off trails. So if you just stay away from the trails and you don't, and and if you, if you put it, you know, off a trail, um, just make sure it's not in the line of view or, you know, put debris or branches between you know, to block their view or something. Just do do something to keep it out of people's view. And, and but I don't even put mud on trail. It's just people are exploring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're exploring the forest. Interesting. Well, and yeah, population, it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting. And it's interesting, the different animal behavior on the different coasts. <laughs> and yeah. maybe the different people behavior, or maybe it's the same. Um, okay, more questions, you guys. What is everyone's favorite moment caught on camera? And if you want to tell about it, you can. And if you want to share it, I can. We can share screen if you, if you want to do that. I'm gonna find it. Go ahead, everybody. I will have to find mine. Okay. <laughs> That's a tough question because, you know, we, I think, you know, we have literally thousands of images um, saved and, and made, but I love the surprises. I, you know, I showed you guys that image of the two owlets. The ones that make me smile are the ones that I most enjoy. The ones that are complete surprises. They're gifts from the forest. They're gifts from the creatures. Um, so that's how I'd answer that. I'm looking for one here. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna show the one. You're ready. All right. Let yeah. me let me give you the screen share. Hold on. All right. Denise's gonna share his with us. It's <laughs> a good one. Ah. It's the rare. I mean, how rare. <laughs> This is two mountain lion mating. 
have to avert my eyes. <laughs> and that was very successful. They got two kitten. Wow. How neat. So this, uh, for the local here in LA, the male is P41. P42. P42, which she died later on at the, during La Tuna Canyon fire. The female is the one was calling. So she's still alive, but she's reaching all the, she's probably 10 years old now. So that's pretty, it's pretty good for a wild mountain lion. But this was, is very unique because yeah. the way I see it is you got the entire forest. Why that spot? Yeah. It's flat. Oh, interesting. It's comfortable. Yeah, you don't I thought that. it was because that's where you had your camera. <laughs> well, you know, maybe they want to make a show, but uh, it, I got a series of 50 pictures and you can see the male approach. I wish I would have it on video because it would have been sound, you know, because I don't think it, it's, if it's like the, I don't know if it's like the same, like the male lion in Africa, but it, they say it's loud. So, but that, this is such a unique picture. Yeah, that's amazing. You don't see that every day. You sure do not. <laughs> you do not. Yeah. So I'm going to. All right. Now, um, Janet. Uh, so I like both the surprises and the ones that I've set up and envisioned a certain way and then having that materialize. So like, for example, I showed you the grasshopper mouse that was howling. That was completely incidental, a complete surprise. But here's one, I can only find it on my, oh wait, I have to do this share screen thing again. Sorry, um, how do I do this? Oh, share screen. And now this, and now share. Can you see this? No? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. badger. A photo of the badger here. Um, that's just, I'm look, you're looking at a blog post here. It's the lead photo on it. And I love this one because, well, first of all, it came out, the lighting was nice and it came out nice and sharp. This is just with a regular trail camera. It's not with a DSLR. And this came, this was like exactly what I envisioned. I targeted a badger den, which is like basically at the base of this sagebrush here. And I had the mountains in the background and I just envisioned this badger coming right near its den and you know having that beautiful background there. And then it's gorgeous, that. Janet. This is beautiful. They hardly ever do what you know what you envision, but this time that, they did. Yeah. That's snow cap, right? Yeah, that's snow cap. Oh, that's. A, yeah. That's. But, uh, I love yeah. it. That's beautiful. Thank you. All right, thank you, and um, we have more questions. We're getting to the end of our time, so we'll have to hurry up, but. Um, okay, Carol is asking, any must-have supplies for your trail cams? Batteries. <laughs> yeah, lots of batteries. I, re I use rechargeables. Um, there, there are disadvantages to them, for sure. Um, they don't last as long in the field, but I, I'm, you know, we go through so many batteries that just ecologically, that's the, the trade-off that I make that I want to, to use rechargeable batteries. Does, does, the re does the browning take rechargeable? Um, yes, no. yeah. But that's a good question because people should know that not all trail cameras yeah. are compatible with rechargeable. So if you want to use them, you need to make sure the camera you get can be used with them. Right. Yeah. Good point. Yes, excellent. No Reconix does. Mm -hmm. Bushnell does, but there is limitation. On DSLR, I use um, well. I use a lot of combination with the DSLR flash. I use rechargeable uh, C battery pack for the flash. Mm. Uh, I custom the the batteries for it, so this way they last longer. Mm. And I use the Tenergy with 5,000 milliampereage of wow. power. So I get four, that's 20, and I get a better flash response. Mm -hmm. So, but I can show you guys to build those. They're very easy to build. The dummy, dummy batteries and, and a cable and 
It lasts longer. <laughs> I love it. The next special is going to be building a camera trap with Denis Kelly. I love it. You can show oh. us now. All right. I love it. We'll plan it. All right. Um, what else? Um, coyote behavior question. Has anyone seen a coyote follow cougars at a distance, perhaps, in hopes of scoring leftovers? That one's from Ron. Never. No. Because never... it's ahead. very difficult to find a deer kill from a lion. They're very difficult. I mean, you have to be in the wood all the time. You have to track the cougar. It is, it's very difficult. All the deer kill I found, it was very, you know, I mean, lucky. Lucky. I did have a coyote lately, came back with a deer leg in his mouth uh, on a pack. Yeah, I can you show it to it. you guys if, if we have time. Sure. Let me... Um... Yeah. Let, let, let me one let me find it. While Denis is looking that up, I'll just say um, that I haven't seen examples of coyotes or other animals trailing cougars, but I've found lots of examples of those animals scavenging on cougar kills. So coyotes, bears, vultures. Um, a, a whole host of animals I've gotten, I've photographed on, on carcasses that have been, that were kills by cougars initially. Yeah, I can't find it. We don't have it. cougars here, so I can't answer. Yep. <laughs> oh, interesting. Didn't even think about that. I just feel like they're everywhere. No, no. Interestingly, um, where I have my camera traps in the foothills of Claremont in the San Gabriel Mountains, um, I get very, very few coyotes. And there are many more coyotes down in the neighborhoods uh, than there are actually up in the, the foothills. So it's, it's not necessarily what you would anticipate. I find it. All right, cool. It's, wor it's worth watching. All right. So I do believe there was a, a deer kill by a, by a lion up canyon, but I cannot enter that property. So I was not able to, for sure, to find out it was, but a deer got killed for sure. That's a... There's a, a dirt road that I often walk on that I have nicknamed Deer Leg Road because once I was hiking up it and about a half hour later, I came down it and there was a deer leg in the middle of the road that wasn't there on the way up. So wow. probably uh, moved there by, uh, by uh, a bear or a coyote or something scavenging. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, this, you guys, this has been so much fun. I really appreciate being able to spend this time with you guys who are my friends. And it's like, we're spending a Friday night together talking about our favorite thing, which I love. And um, just so much respect for the work that you all are doing. Um, gosh, you know, you're all doing so many different things in your lives and yet you still find the time to find your peace with nature and just, and, and, and then share that with others regularly. So, I'm excited and thank you for sharing it with us tonight. And um, for those of you watching, if you enjoyed this, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. That's good for everyone. Please uh, look at websites and um, YouTube channels because there's some more really cool stuff to be found. If you think this is interesting, we're always doing crazy stuff like this here. So please subscribe. And um, next week, we're actually going to take the week off because it is election week. So we'll probably be laughing or crying. I'm not <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> but hopefully you are you have voted or you will be voting and hopefully you'll be voting for wildlife. So um, thank you again. Oh, and the week after that, we're going to get serious again and we're going to be talking about using the winter to prepare for pollinators in the spring. So that's going to be our next program. So thank you again, Denise and Paul and Janet. I, you know, I just appreciate so much that you took the time to join us tonight. Nice thank to meet you, Janet. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for so. joining us. Yeah. So I'm going to. Um... Good night, everyone. Good night. Everyone. Good Keep night. trapping. Yes, that's right. Okay, so I think I'm going to end it. All right. And that. All right. And Denise.